This video will be a brief overview of a lot of the ways that we'll be using matrices in the course um, when later we get to see some of the fun, cool things. So this is more of a preview video to, you get, to give you guys a hint about why, why you should be excited to be studying linear algebra in the first place. So far, all we've really seen is using matrices to solve systems with linear equations. So we started with some matrix um, given by the coefficients of a system of linear equations, um, which we obtained in one of the... It looks something like this. So given, let's say, this system of three equations, um, all in three different unknowns, x1, x2, and x3, um, we obtained two different matrices, um, one a matrix of just the coefficients, and one a matrix of the coefficients and all of the constants that each of those equations was equal to. So I mean, these are two matrices that we care about, but in reality, matrices show up all over the place. So today is just going to be, again, a grab bag of cool places that we're going to see matrices at work. Our first one is, in general, um, matrices are the standard way that data is stored. So depending on the programming language or data structure that you're looking at, um, you're often going to have your information stored in two-dimensional rectangular arrays. Um, this is exactly what we call a matrix earlier, although in matrices we really want all of our coefficients to be entries in some, some field, so something like the real numbers or the complex numbers. Um, our first example that we're going to see of um, just some stored data that's kept in a matrix is going to actually come from um, a local application. Uh, the Hood College Weather Station is actually set up by former students at Hood um, and operates right out of Hudson. So let's look at the data that they collect and how they store it in their matrices. All right, here's some sample data collected by the Hood College Weather Station. So this is publicly available on a web page I'll show you guys at the end of this little segment. But if we look closely, we see that every row, let's say this one, every row in our matrix corresponds to one set of observation observations made by the weather station, and these observations are made every minute. If you look up and down our row, our first row corresponds to the time of all the observations, and each of the subsequent rows corresponds to a different bit of data measured by the weather station itself. So this weather station is actually, you know, it's fairly nice to look through. There's lots of nice analytics built in. So if you guys would like to check this out, it's just at weather.hood.edu. So um, one of the nice things about storing data in these matrices is it's really easy to pull out um, interesting trends from the data. So later on in the course, we'll have a chance to look at some modeling um, with data from the weather station. But for now, let's look at some other applications of matrices. One other application of matrices you've probably seen lots of times is images are actually stored as matrices or sets of matrices. So for grayscale images, so things where it's just stored in black and white, um, each of the pixels in our image, so there are going to be, for every pixel in an n by m image, one of those entries in our matrix is going to be whatever the grayscale value of the, uh, the pixel there is. So those are going to be stored as numbers between 0 and 255 in grayscale. Or for the three channel color images, so this is the you know, RGB values that you might have seen if you guys have ever tried to make a web page, um, each pixel will be stored as um, three different entries in three different matrices. So while you know, this is nice, I think just for simplicity, let's look at how we can actually convert a, um, a black and white image into a, a matrix. So admittedly, this, this isn't a black and white image. So we'll, we'll maybe come back to this image later when we do image compression or image decompression to see how we can look at images like this and actually compress them without losing a lot of data using linear algebra. But for now, let's look at an actual black and white image. So here we go. So this is an image of Felix the cat there on the left, and so each pixel corresponds to, you know, one, one single slot in this. And in reality, the way this is displayed on your screen, each of those pixels is actually many, many, many pixels on your screen. But for simplicity's sake, we can see that for every um, white square, 
we have a 1 over here on the right, and for every black pixel value, we have a black pixel over here on the right. So uh, this is a 35 by 35 pixel black and white image. Again, each 1 is a white pixel and each um, 0 is a black pixel. And we'll come back to a little later in the course, a little more image processing with linear algebra. But if you're curious now and like to um, that Felix the Cat image and the corresponding matrix is actually from a lovely blog post on matrices and digital images available at the Klein Project, project blog. So um, I've included the web address. Feel free to check it out, but we'll have a chance to come back to that in a couple of weeks. So some other applications of matrices that you might not have seen include kind of sillier things like scheduling a dinner party. Um, so let's say you and your friends are interested in um, having a dinner party and you want to introduce you know six people who haven't met each other um, to each other um, but you can only fit up to four people including yourself at any given time so that means you can have three guests and yourself for every dinner um, how many times are you gonna have to host dinner at your house to make sure everybody gets to meet every other person in the group at least once this is going to be a good place for us to start um, in terms of unusual linear algebra problems in that we're really just going to be using the matrix as kind of a bookkeeping device. Our approach here will blend a little bit of linear algebra with a little bit of combinatorics. Um, so let's get started with um, how we can start figuring out what's the fewest number of dinner parties before we pull matrices into it. So uh, we're going to use a matrix eventually to solve this. We're actually going to start by figuring out the smallest possible number of dinner parties we need um, by pointing out that from our six friends, um, for every pair of them to meet, that's the same thing as six choose two, which for those of you that haven't seen this notation before, that's um, that means six factorial divided by two factorial times four factorial. So six choose two counts the number of pairs um, out of six people it can be made, and so there are 15 total of this, these pairs of friends that we're going to have to introduce to each other. Um, at any given dinner, there's going to be at most three possible friends there, because you only have three other seats, and that means that you can make at most three choose two or three different pairs at that meeting. Um, so that means you have to have at least five dinners just as a, an absolute bare minimum so that all 15 of those pairs can meet each other. So to get started, we're going to try to make a matrix that represents each of these dinner parties now that we've got a sense of how few of these we can possibly have. Um, so we're going to let each of the columns in our matrix refer to a, a particular friend that we're inviting. Um, each of the rows in our matrix will refer to which dinner party. So if we um, were trying to schedule a dinner party and our first row had um, the column entries 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, that means that friend 1, friend 2, and friend 3 are the first people that we invite, and your friends 4, 5, and 6 are going to have to hold on to a later dinner party. So let's start with just figuring out, since friend 1 needs to meet everybody, let's say without any loss of generality, we're going to try to get him you know, in all of the dinner parties we need to have him meet everyone, and then not invite him to any after the first couple dinner parties. For our second dinner party, if we want to try to sort of maximize how many new people person 1 can meet, now that he's already met person two, persons 2 and 3, we can have him maybe meet person 4 and 5. We're still not done with person one yet, though, because he's going to have to eventually meet person six. So for now, let's set up a dinner party where person one, it doesn't really matter if, this, if person two is the other person we invite, but it's going to be important that we invite person six to make sure that one and six have met at least once. So this is going to be our setup for, um, for how we're going to try to figure this out, but this is also a good place to pause and note that for person one to have met everyone, we had to have three different dinner parties just to guarantee that he met all five of our other friends. And this isn't going to be unique to person one, because every person that you're inviting 
is going to have to come to at least three dinners so they can meet all five other people. Um, we're going to run into a crunch if we tried to fit all of our diners in in only uh, five dinner parties. So what's our problem? If every person has to come to at least three dinner parties, that means that each column needs at least three ones in it. So where do we get that we need to have at least six dinner parties? Um, since for all of our six friends, each of them is going to have to come to at least three dinner parties, that means we have to have 18 you know, total ones inside this matrix minimum. So with our 18 possible ones in here, and only three ones per row, that means we're going to have to have six different, one, uh, six different dinner parties or six different rows of this matrix. Um, so for the next bit, I'm just going to let you guys try this out and see if you can figure out like a possible dinner party. So I'm going to give you guys a solution in just a second, but this is a good place to pause before continuing if you'd like to solve the dinner party problem on your own. Remember our matrix so far, um, we had person one trying to meet as many people as possible. You can rewind in the video and see like the first three possible dinner parties, or you can try this out yourself and see if you can find a solution that has six dinner parties, which we know is the fewest possible that we can have and guarantee everyone meets everyone else. So try this out and unpause when you're ready to move on to the solution. So here's the solution. Here's one of many possible solutions. So I stuck with the original, um, you know, the original three possible dinner parties that I set up, and just found three other, like dinner parties, so that every single person came three times. So you can check the solution to see that every individual person pairs up with everyone else at least once. From here, we're going to move on and look at a few other applications of linear algebra, um, more just generally looking at places that matrices arise very naturally and problems that we would all care about. So a sample application of matrices shows up when we're studying things like travel networks, public transportation networks, or social networks. So let's start with travel networks as, as one of our easiest ones to describe. What you can see here is Garuda Indonesia domestic and regional network of flights connecting um, the capital city um, to most of the outlying like major cities in the area and heading over to you know, several other countries in the area. So looking at, at this, what we're going to do is try to create a matrix that keeps track of which cities are connected in this air network. So uh, just in terms of space, I'm not going to try to connect all 31 cities that were in that network in a single matrix. We're just going to zoom in and look at Jakarta and all of the cities in Indonesia to the northwest. Um, so we're going to order these by um, from city number one will be the furthest west, city number two, city number three, city number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and city number 10 will be Jakarta as the furthest west city um, that we're specifically looking at in this air network. And what we're going to do is, when two cities are connected by an air network, as city 1 and city 2 are, we're going to put a 1 in the entry between 1 and 2. And since this isn't a directed network, we're assuming that flights both travel um, to and from city 1. Um, we're going to put a 1 in both entry 1, 2, and an entry 2, 1. If we look besides these two cities, every other city is connected only to Jakarta. So that means in between city 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, cities 2 through 9 are connected to city 9. So we'll see ones in this row, except um, uh, Jakarta is not connected to um, Banda Se, and we don't say that a city is connected to itself. Um, so this is a very simplified travel network in that it has a central hub with mostly immediately outlying cities that are connected directly to it. Uh, later we'll have a chance to analyze larger, larger networks.
Another place we might use um, an, a, what, that matrix that we saw before is actually often called an adjacency matrix or a network matrix. Um, we might use a matrix to look at um, stops that are connected in a public transportation system. So what we would do is when we're trying to identify um, two different, you know, a connection between, let's say, Shady Grove and Van Ness, um, we would keep track of a matrix that had a one between each stop. And so there would be one row and one column for every stop in this entire entire network of cities. Um, and we would put a one in a slot in a row connected to one city and a column corresponding to another if there was a direct line between the two of them, like a, a single stop jump. So we would have a, a, a one in the column corresponding to Shady Grove and the row corresponding to Rockville, but not between Shady Grove and, say, Bethesda, since those aren't adjacent stops. Once we learn a little bit more about matrix multiplication, we'll be able to see how having this immediate adjacency network will let us actually look at powers of matrices later, when we have multiplication, um, to try to figure out what's the fewest number of stops before we're going to find a connection between two cities. So we'd be able to use one of these local adjacency matrices to tell us something about the distance between a pair of nodes in our network. In this network, you might also notice, if you've ever traveled in DC, um, on all of these lines, there are routes heading in both directions. So there are routes going from New Carrollton all the way out to Vienna Fairfax, and there are trains heading back in the other direction. So we would um, include like a, a one both from New Carrollton to Landover and from Landover back to New Carrollton, but there are actually lots of public transportation networks out there where there aren't routes in both directions. You might, for example, have to travel in a loop to get back to where you started. So we'll look at later at directed matrices when our, you know, we actually do have uh, routes that head from one node to the other but not back. Um, from here, we're going to look at another application of large-scale networks. You guys are probably even more, and that's going to be social networks. So this is a visualization of someone's social network, where each node in this network represents a person, and the size of the network actually represents the number of liked posts that this person would have. So um, we wouldn't actually have to have our nodes be huge, but you can actually see as we go further out, outlying nodes tend to have smaller social influence than nodes that are here in the center of our particular network. So we're going to come back again at a later date and look at how um, graphs of social networks can be encoded um, in matrices. It's pretty clear. It's going to be a one, uh, if you have a node corresponding to person one and a node corresponding to person two, if they know each other, there will be a one in slot one, two, and in slot two, one, assuming it's mutual knowing. Um, but these are really interesting problems for us to use linear algebra to approach. From here we're going to go to one more sort of bread and butter application of linear algebra, which is going to be transformations using matrices. So this will be one of the first applications that we're going to really see in the course, rather than just cool applications I'll allude to that we need some more mechanics for. But linear transformations allow us to take some space. So for example, a a square, which doesn't sound like it's that exciting, but it turns out this is going to be the building blocks of a lot of things like graphics and looking at three-dimensional um, three dimensional moving objects use a lot of linear transformations in implementing them. One linear transformation that we can do using matrices is going to be scaling. And we'll come back later to see exactly how we can write a matrix um, that takes in, we'll see later, a pair of vectors and outputs a scaled pair of vectors, so a larger two-dimensional space. Um, another linear transformation that we'll be studying is there are going to be matrices that let us rotate, um, like given objects, matrices that let us do something called a shear transformation, which is we um, add one column of our matrix um, to another. So those are all sort of basic, like, you know, fun look-aheads at what we're going to be playing with in linear algebra. So we're going to come back later in the course and see things like 
finding minimal paths and networks, um, encryption and decryption of codes, and cryptography use a great deal of linear algebra and matrix theory. Um, error detection and correction and transmission. So things like how does your cell phone actually transmit your voice to your, um, your friend that you're on the line with without breaking up. And it turns out that's actually a pretty high level application of linear algebra. Um, edge detection and images. So if I gave you that image of the, the Dalmatian puppies, how could you figure out the outline of the puppies in the image just using the entries in a matrix? Um, we're going to look at image compression and sharpening using SVG decomposition later. And we'll do a bunch of uh, transformations in 2D and 3D graphics looking at how we can change our perspective on an object using matrices. So this is more of a, you know, just a quick snapshot to give you guys a, an idea of what we're studying and what we're going to be heading towards. And next time we're going to come back and look just a little bit more about definitions in matrices and basic matrix operations. So see you guys next time, and bye.